for the past six years that I've been an activist, I've learned so many lessons and I've gone through so many ups and downs. So from my experience, I would like to make 10 confessions to all of you. Uh, okay, so number one, I am not as good as you may think. So um, a lot of the times when I tell people that I'm an activist, they automatically assume, oh, you know, you must be a straight A student. You must be the president of the student body. You know, you must be such a good little angel. And um, no, <laughs> um, no, not by any means that I am. Okay, so no, I'm, I'm not good by well, really any means. But not to say that I'm like necessarily like a bad person or anything. It's just that it's always this constant idea that in order to be successful, that you have to play by all of the rules. But to be an activist, you kind of have to not play by the rules. Actually, playing by the rules goes against what it means to really be a rebel. Number two, I can't save everyone. And, um, what I mean by this is, okay, so an activist's natural instinct is to rescue, is to save. But we have to understand that still as activists, that there's many things that we cannot do. So take my older brother, for example, right? He loves to argue, specifically with me. <laughs> um, so what he'll do a lot of the times is just walk up to me and just start an argument. And in this moment, my activist senses will start to tingle. And I'll feed into this argument. But this is when I have to take a step back and really realize that I can't change everything, especially people, and then especially my older brother. So, um, and what this actually is, is a means of self-care for an activist. Because many of the times as activists, we put our bodies and we put our minds on the line. So we really have to learn when we have to take a step back and value our sanity and value our health over a petty argument with your older brother. So number three, it is both a blessing and a curse to be an activist. Now, the main thing that I love about being an activist is the new perspective that I've gained. I am aware of so many issues, and I learn something new every day, and I love it. And it's a wonderful thing to be woke. But at times, it makes it very hard to do things. I am such an activist that I'm like hyper aware of my consumption of everything. So like, I can't even watch TV anymore. As soon as something's on, I'm like, mm, well, that doesn't represent black people well. It's, it's filled with stereotypes, right? So being an activist is like being unveiled. So it's wonderful because, you know, I see things for what they are. But it, by God, does it make it hard to watch TV sometimes? Um, number four. There's a million ways to be an activist. I think a lot of people get the wrong assumption and think that activism is all about, you know, some crazy riot that's blocking traffic on Broad Street. And I agree, like, I used to think like that too. I was all here for the crazy protest, for the chance, for everything. But I have to understand that protesting isn't even the right strategy more than half the time. You know, um, depending on what your cause is, you can do smaller but equally meaningful deeds to serve your own activism. That can mean starting a conversation. That can mean starting a nonprofit. And although I agree, you know, protesting definitely serves its purpose, it's not always the right thing to do. Because as an activist, we have to always make sure that we're employing the right strategies at the right time to really fight for what we need. Number five, no activist is an island. So when a lot of people ask me a lot of times, you know, they ask, oh, how did you get so successful? You know, how did you do it? What's your secret? And <laughs> I'm actually a little bit embarrassed to admit this. But um, I would always say, you know, oh, I thank you. You know, it was all me. You know, nobody helped me. I did it myself. And I actually admit that this was the wrong answer. You know, when I think back to who taught me activism, it came from the works of Audre Lorde and Angela Davis and other wonderful black women. And then when I think to, well, who empowered me to speak, it actually came from two of my mentors, Miss Ayana and Miss Erin. 
Um, Ms. Ayana is the facilitator of a youth leadership council that I'm on. And every day for the past four years that I've been doing this council, she has given me countless amounts of opportunities to speak my piece and to work on what I can do. And then secondly, Ms. Erin, who's my boss at the library, she's the main person who's always empowered me to speak. She has opened up and created an amazing space for not only me, but for bunches of young people to come to the library to have a voice. And then I have my two best friends. I have Layla and Nia. And every day they remind me how proud they are of me. And we always plan our futures together. So I confess that I didn't do any of this on my own. And if it wasn't for those wonderful, wonderful people, I could not be able to do what it is that I do. Because to raise an activist takes a village. Number six. Um, you won't always get the result that you want. And this is another curse of being an activist, unfortunately, because, okay, so there's a million and one issues in the world, right? And it takes such hard work to overthrow these systems of oppression. I know I work every day to get rid of these daily injustices. But I understand that at the end of the day, you know, Injustice just might win. It might just win at the end of the day. So while it sucks, it really sucks to have all of your hard work just, you know, not get the result that you want and be in being failure, it doesn't mean that the work that you did was necessarily useless. You know, many activists will spend their entire lives, their entire lives, fighting for what they want and might not get the result that they want to see in their lifetime. But that's not always the point of activism. Sometimes it's more so about carving a path for the next generation to pick up where you left off. And that's honestly the result that you need in activism sometimes. Number seven, the personal is political and the political is personal. So when you really think about it, everything is political. Everything is involved in politics, from the neighborhoods you live in, the job you work, the schools you attend, the phone in your pocket, the TV shows that you watch are political. And even when people are like, you know, I don't do politics, you know, I'll stay away from that, it's not my thing. It's still a political decision even to say that you don't want to be political. And I see this in people all the time. And what I really feel like it is, is this fear of being political, and it's this fear and, and just being scared all the time. But I have to tell you that, unfortunately, you can't escape politics. And even to the many times that I love activism to the times that I hate it and I hate politics, I have to understand that I cannot always run away from it and I can't be scared of it. So you shouldn't be scared of it either, and you should actually embrace politics. Number eight, don't tear down what you cannot replace. And <laughs> this is actually a little bit more funny. So <laughs> I had an internship in the 10th grade as a radio and podcasting intern. And like most young activists during this time, I was more so about tearing things down. So every day I walked into this internship, I was like, yeah, yeah, let's tear down the system. Let's get radical, my guy. And <laughs> I love doing it. I love doing it. But then one day, my, my boss at the time, she looked at me and she was like, you know, you like to tear down things too much. And at first I was like, well, what you mean? Like, <laughs> I'm not doing it. This is what I do. I tear things down. But then this is when she decides to school me. And she actually says, well, you know, it's not about what tearing things, it's not about tearing things down that makes you an activist. It's about what you replace with them. And my mind was blown when she said that. I was like, oh my gosh, that makes a lot more sense. You know, and I think a lot of activists were always in the mindset of tearing things down, but our job as activists is to not simply tear down, but to rebuild these systems to be just as they should be, you know, fair and equal to everyone and everything. And that is the focus of activism. Number nine, it's not all about school. Okay, so, you know, people ask me, you know, all the time, you know, they're like, oh, you must be 
such an exceptional student to be able to do things like this, you know, go places, talk, you know, you're so successful and outspoken, you must be so good at school. And I don't like this assumption, and I don't like it because, okay, even though I admit I get A's and B's, I do well in school, okay, you got me, but that's not what it's about, you know? Because there's nothing that I could care less about than school. <laughs> um, and it's because, you know, we have all this time, we have students who literally validate, validate who they are and their true ability on grades. And students go even so far as to base their self-worth on an SAT score. This is insane. Like, this is crazy. This is an awful way to get one's self-esteem. So I have to correct people when they say, oh, you must be so good at school. And I have to tell them, well, I'm not intelligent because of school. I am intelligent despite school. I am intelligent because I am intelligent. You know, and usually this is when people like, they're like, what? What? <laughs> and I have to tell them no. And the reason why I'm so successful is because I actually seize opportunities that are outside of school. You know, and it's these outside opportunities that actually helped me to launch my career in activism while in high school. So I have to tell you that no, it's not all about school. It's about the opportunities that students, you know, take seize of in order to get what they need. And number 10, um, I can't be the next anyone, but I can be the first me. You know, as much as I want to, I want to be the next James Baldwin, I want to be the next Malcolm X, I want to be the next Audre Lorde, and even though these are my idols, and I want to be them, I can't, you know? They lived their own lives, they had their own opinions, they did what they need to do. And luckily, they did that for me so that they can carve my path. But I understand that there's still a lot more carving to do. And this is when I have to confess that I have an ability that James Baldwin didn't have, that Angela Davis doesn't have, because I am me. And that is the unique power that every activist can, has in themselves. And it is up to me to take, you know, to pick up where they left off, but I can literally take this whole movement in a completely new direction. Why? Because I'm me. And I have an ability that they didn't have, and I have the opportunity to do what they could not. And you know, even you know, decades to come from now, hopefully, you know, other young black girls would look at what I did and be like, you know, I want to be just like you. And even then, I'll tell them, no, you don't have to be me. You have your own power. You have your own ability, and it is it is up to you to take charge of that power so that you can move this movement along and fight for your cause the way you want to. And that is what I think is really, really beautiful about activism. So finally, you know, I know that there's a lot of issues and a lot of problems that, that are in the world and that activists face daily. And I also know that being an activist is a 24-7 job. But to be honest, I really wouldn't want it any other way because I am a part of a movement to change the world. And I believe in my heart of hearts that this is what I was honestly born to do. And I hope that you feel the same. So thank you for listening to the 10 Confessions of a Teenage Activist. <laughs>